This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. Amy, welcome to the show. Honored to have you on and get to meet you. And I, I know you have a long background in real estate. And then now you're doing something a little different now, but in the real estate field as well. And, and looking forward to learning more about that. I know it's going to be educational to the listeners. Give them a little more about maybe your focus right now and how you got there. So right now I work for a company called Agora, which basically is an investment management software. But my whole background has basically been real estate and I love real estate and I love technology. And so where the two, you know, come together is something that I'm very passionate about. And really real estate is an industry that specifically needs a lot of technological advancement. So I'm happy to be part of that process basically. So you were in real estate though for many years, right? And then tell me about why you transitioned to the tech side or maybe that thought process a little bit. Yeah, no problem. Like you mentioned, I've been in real estate my whole life. And, you know, in real estate, things were always done a certain way. The deals are made in person. There's a lot of old school way of doing things in terms of commercial real estate. And so everyone was getting by kind of without so much innovation. And then slowly but surely, the investor base changed. And, you know, all of a sudden we had these millennials that are getting involved in the industry, becoming investors, and the expectations are different. And so it kind of forced the industry to, to move in that direction. And given the fact that there was so much need for, for what's out there and the, and the expectations were there, it really pushed everything forward. And I was drawn to it because of my background in real estate about all the ways technology can help the industry move in that direction. Why do you think uh, like the real estate industry has moved so slowly you know, to adjust to technology? Until recently, right? Where... I think technology actually helped more people, giving more people access to the industry. But in the past, it's always been, you know, multi-generational real estate giants that have been in the industry and they were used to doing things a certain way. And who were the new people to tell them that this is not the right way, right way to do it? They're doing this for years and everything was working fine. So I think, you know, as these the generations have moved forward and the children and grandchildren of these real estate giants either branched out on their own or brought the business to forward, I think that kind of started the transition. But that's, I, that's, I think, the reason why it moves so slowly. It makes sense, right? I mean, they feel like, I mean, I know of large real estate portfolios owned by families who have been in the family for, you know, 80 to 100 years, if a couple of generations or third generation, I guess, actually managing it. And they kind of want to do it the same way grandpa always did it. You know, right. it's kind of a big mental block. I've seen that. But just looking at it, I can see so many inefficiencies. It's just amazing how much income is left, you know, not being had because of those inefficiencies or the willingness to adapt to new technology that could help them perform so much better. Yeah, 100%. So you recognize this need. And what about from your experience in real estate? What are some, maybe some technologies that you've noticed that are just crucial now to operating as efficiently as possible, even outside of an investor portal. We'll talk about that some, but any, anything else that, you know, over many years of real estate, you've seen just happen that have helped you all to just operate better. There's so many things. So, I mean, uh, my background is property management in Manhattan, for example. So in Manhattan, the way you have it is most buildings, especially like luxury buildings, they have doormen and there's packages. And I can't tell you how overwhelming it is for these doormen, especially around December time, when they get like an influx of packages, keeping track of everything, giving it to the tenants, making sure that everything is secure. So one of the first technologies that I was really exposed to was a, a technology at the time it's called My Buildings. I think it was bought by a different company now, but basically it was to help doormen and luxury buildings in Manhattan to be able to keep track of maintenance requests and all the packages that came in and really just keep everything organized so no one lost anything. It was really like out of a desperation that, that this kind of happened. And there's also like, it goes beyond that. There's the, even though this is not like so, you know, technologically advanced, even something like a key track system, where instead of keeping 500 keys hanging in the key box, right, you have a, a key track system where you literally record the person's fingerprint, then the door opens, 
it's now logged on what they're taking. There's a little ma a magnet on the bottom that you pull up the key. So now you know who took that key last. And when it goes missing, you know who to go to. And it's not just laying around for anyone to take in the office. It's in a locked box that could only be opened by a fingerprint. So that's another example. Uh, obviously, keeping track of leasing, you know, that's huge. I mean, before we had all this technology in terms of leads and leasing, and I mean, it was crazy. You'd write it down on a piece of paper. Uh, you have to remember how many times you followed up with the right person, you know, take all the notes by hand, all while other people are coming in and you're like, taking notes by hand, it's really uh, very inefficient. And I mean, and it goes so much, you know, there's so much more. There's water metering technology and investment management technology. And really, it really spans everything. There's a technology to look for new real estate. It's really come a long way in the past 20 years. No doubt about it. I mean, I've not seen the fingerprint readers. That, that's incredible uh, technology right there. You know, I know that's probably more property management focused, right? But what about on the acquisition side? I know you were in acquisitions as well. Any tech that, that has helped in that space? Yeah, so for sure. First of all, you have the way it works with real estate. There's so much information you need to pull from everywhere. You need to do market research. You need to understand what your comps are. You know, you need to understand lots of different little data points. And until companies started aggregating it, you'd have to go to these individual places. You'd have to get on the phone, call, which is it's still important to do, by the way, obviously. But technologies that aggregate information that's in a bunch of different places really make it much easier to research a property or a market when you're underwriting it. And even now, they, they, they've taken a step further. There's different companies that use AI in order to like automatically do a lot of the research for you. Instead of just aggregating, it takes it to the next step and kind of does some of your work for you per se. So that, that has really been very helpful. And I can tell you also, like even something as simple as Google Maps, right? I mean, without Google, like 20 years ago, you'd have to drive to all these properties. If you're looking at a property in a different state, I mean, you're literally losing so much time going there, walking the properties. Here, at least you can look around the neighborhood, use Google Maps to see what things look like, get an idea of the situation before you have to actually spend time to take it to the next level, basically. How do we live without Google Maps? I mean, oh it <laughs> just blows my mind. You, know, you, you tell somebody uh, or you ask somebody how to get somewhere, you know, and, and they want to give you the directions. I'm like, just give me the address, right? Yeah. <laughs> just give me this. Yeah. It seems so easy now, but boy, without yeah. it. Remember when you have to re uh, remember phone numbers. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We won't yeah. be able to contact anybody. We won't be able to get anywhere. On that same note, though, you know, now you've moved in this field with uh, Agora, and I think we should discuss it some because I feel like it's a, I mean, we also use an investor portal and couldn't live without it now. It's, uh, you know, uh, Google Maps, right? And come that part of our, our business. Uh, but, uh, you know, Agora, I don't know that I've heard of Agora. Maybe I have, maybe, uh, but, you know, not in a while, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm not as familiar anyway, but I'd love to just know a little more about Agora. Uh, I know, uh, you know, if you are syndicating deals, if you are raising money from investors, and uh, funding, uh, you know, through that method, uh, I mean, a platform like this is just a necessity. I mean, it is so worth the investment. I mean, some people say, oh, it's too expensive. I can still do my Excel sheet. And I'm like, good luck. You know, uh, there is just no reason to not use a platform like this. Uh, if you want to have a professional presence as well for your investors and them have a, a portal, I mean, account where they can log in securely and sign documents, just making their life easier. That is our goal. And so we just love love stuff like this. Give us a little about Agora, maybe a few things that stand out to you that, you know, Agora does or how they stand out maybe in that industry. Excellent. So you really hit on it perfectly. I mean, there's two sides of the story. It's the inefficiency on the GPs or the syndicator side, right? The doing everything either by spreadsheets, making individual phone calls, sending out individual emails, sending out all the documents individually to people is very inefficient. Whatever money you think you're spending on a software, you are spending more money on labor. There's no question, but it goes beyond that. It, it's the investors, right? The, the investors expect more. There's no reason why investing in real estate should be any different than logging on to your Morgan Stanley or your bank account. Why should you not log in, know exactly how much money you have, know exactly what went in, what went out, all the reports are there. There's no reason not to have that. And you know what? I can tell you, I've been in real estate companies for many years. What happens every single quarter, if you don't have a technology, you get calls from, I don't know, 25% of your investors. No one knows how much money they have. 
one know, no one understands the returns. Everyone's like said, you didn't send me my K1 from 2015, you know? And even just fielding those phone calls is crazy. And a system like ours, like our software, for example, you could raise for the whole deal. We have a CRM built in. You can keep track of everything organized in different categories. You can sign all the documents all online and you could generate reports, send out 100 K1s with two clicks and sending individual emails. If you want to send a document out to all your investors that need to sign, it could literally be prepared in 10 minutes and then go out to everyone. You could send out emails that are integrated into your email system and into the system. It's really very easy. And even people that are using technology, let's say, to help them with this process, it, it needs to be aggregated and, and connected in one centralized location. Now, if you're using you know, maybe something for your emails and something for your data storage, and maybe you have a CRM, so you're now using four or five different technologies, but nothing talks to each other. So it's really the, the most efficient way to, to deal with it is to really have one centralized system where it's accessible to your investors. It's easy to use so that they actually use it because if it's complicated, they're not going to touch it. And it's easy to use from your side. It increases efficiency. Your investors will be happy, will invest with you more because you have such a simple process. You know, listen, the investors are not only investing their money with you, you know, they're investing time and they want to invest as little of that time as possible. They want to, they, they, you know, most of your investors have other jobs. You know, this is not what they want to be doing. They want this to be as smooth as possible so they can make, a, make an informed decision of where to put their money and then be able to step back and check in every once in a while, whenever they want at their convenience. I think also like it, it helps an operator just have such more an official or presence, right? With your investors, right? They log into this portal, they see your branding, uh, you know, it's just so much better than having to, uh, anyone that's been syndicating for a while. And if you can remember like mailing documents back and forth and having to have them signed and then it wasn't done correctly and you're having to mail it back. And yeah, I mean, it's just it takes all that nonsense out, right? You know, as much as possible as it saves, like you said, so much time. Would you walk me through a little bit how Agora does say, and because this affects the operator in a big way and his team, just because I know from personal experience uh, and the investor, just the capital raise process, you know, in a system like this, what should an operator expect when they're going to launch a new deal, new fund, they're going to send it out to their investors, kind of what happens, you know, then what does Al Gore do for them, the operator or the passive investor? Yeah, so great question. So it all starts with the CRM. So what you would do is, you know, let's say you moved over to Agora or Agora would basically, you know, take your investor base, but even it doesn't have to be your current investors. Even if you have no deals and you're raising for your new deal, you take your list of 300 people with their email addresses, the people you want to reach out to. And then you're able to communicate with them through the CRM. Once you have an actual deal, you can gauge the interest. Maybe it's not a deal that's appropriate for all your investors. So you need to pick specific investors who you want to reach out to with this deal. And you can easily attach the investors to that specific deal and upload all the information into a data room for them to review and communicate directly with them for the people that are appropriate for the specific deal. But once again, it all starts with the CRM it, that helps you keep track of everything, keep everyone into categories. Because you know what? You're going to have investors that, that want a stabilized deal with quarterly returns and only want to be in it two to three years and want their principal back. You'll have other investors that you know are okay with doing a development deal where they don't see a single penny except a huge upside in five years. Those are not the same people. And they, they, you should not show them the same deal. And it won't look professional if you just show them the same deal. You need to keep everyone organized. And also, the guy who's investing $50,000 is not the same guy who's investing a million dollars. You need to keep track of everything, categorize it properly. And systems such as ours allows you to really keep track of everything and search with filters and really be organized instead of doing your, you know, using a spreadsheet, which is not efficient and, and bound to have mistakes. And another thing, by the way, all the communication and documents that are, you're sending now in email and whatnot, that's not a secure way to be sending very sensitive documents. So our system is fully encrypted and is very secure. And, and that's why it's important to use a system, you know, a, you know, a, a secure system in, in, instead of doing what you have been doing, not you, but you know, yeah. the, the, the majority actually of, of, of real estate GPs are using nothing. And I'm talking about multi-billion dollar funds and the guy just getting started, starting out. And you also touched on this a little bit before. If you're just starting out, besides the fact that you're probably just one person 
and you need to do everything yourself. This really presents, it makes you present yourself as if, you know, are professional and really know what you're doing. And that uh, is very helpful, especially getting started in this business. No doubt about it. Yeah, it's such a, it's a, a must of an investment. If you ask me, uh, it, it's just, uh, you want to have that, I call it like a white glove approach for your investors. You want to make their life as easy as possible. And this is one way that, man, it just takes out so, so many things that I, I just think it also lessens the number of mistakes, potential mistakes, right? Uh, you know, between you and your team, when you can automate so much of this process. And what about the banking side of it? Have you all integrated that yet in, in this system as far as uh, distributions or investing through the portal, things like that? Yeah, so distributions can be made in multiple ways through the system. There's uh, bank transfers. There's, the system is able to produce a NACHA file, which you can then bring to the bank and you know have them do ACHs for you. There's multiple options with that. And in terms of, uh, you know, doing the distributions and calculating it, you know, the system is able to you can either pull it directly from the system, which the, with the data that's in there. But if you are really attached to spreadsheets, which I know real estate people love spreadsheets. And if you don't want to completely get rid of your spreadsheet, you want to keep just one, then you could actually drag the spreadsheet in and the system actually cross references the information and allows you to input it that way as well. So it's very dynamic and, and it's meant to work for you, not you to work for it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So thanks again, Jamie. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. No problems. You can email me at jamie at agorareal.com. Check me out on LinkedIn also. You can connect with me there. And you could also check out our website, agorareal.com. Dot com and I'm happy to speak to anyone. Ted, welcome to the show. It's an honor to meet you. I know many of the group there at Spartan and think very highly of them. And so I, I look forward to this conversation and just looking through your experience. Me and I am just looking to learn from you. I know the listeners are going to learn a lot from your many years of experience of investing and just in this industry. Uh, but give us a little more of that. Give us a little bit about who you are before you're part of the Spartan team and maybe some years there that have helped just grow you and teach you what you know now. Well, Whitney, thanks so much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be on your show and the company that you keep is very impressive. So thanks for having me. A little bit about my background. I'm in my early fifties, grew up in Seattle and in college, I did an internship at Merrill Lynch in Seattle and turned that into a 16 year run. The last Nine years or so, I was a discretionary uh, portfolio manager in their PIA program. It's just an advisory service. I spent a total of uh, 24 years as an investment advisor, six of those as a chief compliance officer, and had the, in retrospect, the very wonderful experience of working with several regulatory bodies, you know, just routine and customary audits. But it's interesting. You learn a lot when a regulator asks questions about investors that you're providing a service to. And so you get to see the perspective, see the regula regulatory body's perspective. So it's, it was an interesting uh, chapter of life. Beyond that, I was a, an owner of WealthFlex, self-directed IRA facilitator, and we sold that to Yield Street in 2019. And that platform that we developed is now the backbone of the retirement accounts at Yield Street. After that chapter of life, I joined Spartan Investment Group on the investor relations team. And I, <laughs> every day is an adventure in this industry, but I'm pleased, just so tickled that the people that I work next to are just genuine and sincere folks. They care deeply for the employees at Spartan and they get that back from us as employees. So anyway, that's a little of my background. No, that's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. Yes, as I was telling you, I think most of them have been on the show, except you all have grown a lot lately. So there's many more now that uh, I need to meet, but i uh, honored to have you on as well. But, you know, just with that much experience, you know, in, in real estate, just in investing over many years, I, I'd love to just jump into some things you've observed and maybe you can help shine some light on, on things you've learned, right? Uh, you know, just being in the industry that long and helping us with some maybe do's and don'ts that you've seen other people or try, you know, do or, or things they've fallen into that uh, maybe you see coming now or you see other people, you know, making those same mistakes. It's a very generous way you teed that up. It's, and so I want to, first of all, say I'm not the smartest guy in the room and 
I do have some scar tissue. I have had the pleasure of working with hundreds of investors over the decades. And so I've seen some mistakes made. It's been my uh, pleasure to work very closely with a number of ultra high net worth families, hundreds of millions of dollars and many, many high net worth folks. Anyway, I, I think a trait that is paramount to develop is to identify within ourselves what our, tr our true risk appetite is. And I know for certain that younger folks, they really love to win more than they hate to lose. And there's a day that each of us wakes up and the world looks a little differently. And it's usually a life event. Maybe it's the dot-com bubble. Maybe it's 2008 through 2012, where it was a scorched earth mentality, uh, almost. But there's a day, there comes a day where every investor wakes up and they see the world a little differently and they begin to swing from, I love to win more than I hate to lose. And they begin to adopt the, I hate to lose more than I love to win. Mm. And so th those life events that lead to scar tissue, whatever the circumstance, it develops an itch on the back of your neck when you start to see what some may view as a bubble and others may view as this is the new normal. You know, low interest rates do a lot of things, especially when it's gone on for 10 years or 11 years. So in retrospect to cap rates in the, you know, high sevens, you know, here we are in the mid fives, at least with regard to self-storage. And will interest rates rise? Yeah, probably. When? Boy, who knows? I've been dead wrong for seven years. And my wife is tired of me pontificating on what might be an interest rate world. So, uh, but nonetheless, I think a, a trait that investors should really develop is understanding themselves. What is their risk appetite? How do you defend that risk ap appetite and how do you live into that risk appetite? And that's a, you know, today's $20 bu buzzword, living into something. I, I think I know what that means. I, I, I think that means maintaining a true representation in your portfolio of what you would tell somebody your risk appetite is. So if the Fed starts to wiggle, if interest rates repeat what we did in the spring of this year, you know, 10 year moving from a buck 20 to a buck 75, or maybe it's 1.70 uh, for the yield on the 10 year. You know, if that happens again and continues, we, you know, what will cap rates do? What will market values do? And, and so investors need to really understand how to defend the risk posture and how to reallocate and reduce risk by including, and here's a crazy concept, by including asset classes that are not the best performers. You know, as investors, we all want, well, how much can I make on this investment? Okay, I get that. I, t I totally get that because I do that myself. But allocating to investments that are maybe closer to the dollar, that maybe have a shorter timeline, those are key traits. So anyway, back to the question. I think understanding ourselves and being true to ourselves and ma managing and monitoring the risk profile that you're trying to marry, that's key. It's huge. And everybody lost track of that in the late 90s with the dot-com bubble and again in 2007 through 2012. So I think that's the number one on no, on awesome. Well, there's a couple of things I want to talk about or bring out. It's, yeah, some great points. And, you know, you mentioned, like, what is your, knowing what your risk appetite is and and knowing how to define it. Uh, how would you help somebody figure that out a little bit? I know that everybody's situation is different and, you know, everybody's portfolio is different or how much time they have, you know, before retirement or investing, all these things that's, that are unique to each individual investor. But just any questions, any things that uh, may help somebody think about to think through, well, what is my risk appetite? You know, how much risk am I open to? So in the world of stocks and bonds, it's much easier to speak to that. It's a little bit more difficult in real estate as these are assets that are not readily liquid unless you're working with a broker dealer. And even if you are working with a broker dealer and you can find a marketplace to sell into, that may not be in your best interest, candidly. By way of stocks and bonds, it's the drawdown. And there's a famous saying in the world of portfolio management that your biggest drawdown is still in front of you which if you really think about, that's very scary. You know, for myself, my peer group in their early fifties, my friends are beginning to retire. 
which scares me to death because I've seen dozens and dozens of investors truly go through the accumulation, start to move into the distribution phase of life. And then because they're not doing anything, their personalities change and it's not awesome from my perspective. But by way of drawdowns, the way to protect against that is to pull assets that you've made off the table. And if we all think about it, truly, when's the last time we intentionally sold into this massive run that we've experienced in the stock market the last 10 years? I mean, if you take the gains for, that you've made in the last year or two years, if you take that off the table and move it into a bond fund, you might get one and a half percent rate of return, which is so unattractive. And it takes so much intentional discipline to do, but it's very appropriate. So that's way. what you mean when you say including asset classes that are not, quote, like best performing, right? But precisely. Or even those asset classes, and I'm, I'm not providing advice here, I'm just speaking about myself. Even asset classes that are uh, they're really boring, like life settlements. You know, that's an asset class that personally I'm looking into. And I, f I find a lot of attractiveness there. Bill Gates put a half a billion dollars into life settlements in 2020, which really keyed me in on the idea, you know, maybe that's not used car salesmen. And by the way, I don't mean to throw shade on car salespeople. They're more important now than ever before. But there is a, I, I think we, we catch the, the inference there that insurance is not, it's not a bad asset class. There's a lot of attractiveness from somebody in my age category. But you're correct, Whitney, the underperforming assets of today can be tomorrow's absolute darling, much the way bonds were a darling asset in 2008 through 2012. I mean, they just didn't lose value. Well, to, some of them did that were lower credit quality, but to, for, for corporates and gubbies that were high quality, they, you know, they held up good. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Ted? It's been a pleasure to meet you and hear about your background and even a little bit about what Spartan's been up to, but just your experience and, and, and you being able to shed some light on different things you have learned, different things you want investors to know about, different maybe concepts that they probably haven't thought about as well that maybe they need to think about depending on their risk appetite, right? And so just grateful for that and, and just you being willing to share on the show. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. So Spartan Investment Group is spartan-investors.com on the internet. I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I don't know how to use Snapchat, but I know how to use LinkedIn. So you can find me on LinkedIn and just search for Spartan or Ted Green. Happy to hear from anybody. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.